Hi guys and welcome back to the Bronte Book Club. As always with my Bronte Book Club videos, today's video is sponsored as part of my role as Bronte Society Young Ambassador. And today is the final instalment of the Bronte Book Club where I'm going to be talking about Anne Bronte's The Tenant of Wildfell Hall. It's a very emotional moment for me because I've really loved the past year as Young Ambassador running the book club and I've had so much fun reading all of the books and reading all of your comments and seeing you read the books alongside me. So it is going to be an emotional moment discussing The Tenant of Wildfell Hall, but it is a great book to end the year on and I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. So The Tenant of Wildfell Hall was published in 1848 and was Anne Bronte's second published novel, her first being Agnes Grey. In today's video I would like to discuss some of my favourite elements in the book, specifically the way that we raise children and the way that we raise boys differently from girls and also the concept of universal salvation and whether we really all are doomed to end up in hell if we do bad things on earth. In both of her novels Anne is occupied with thinking about how we raise children. For example in Agnes Grey she's talking about a governess's relationship with the children she has to look after and how that relationship differs when they are not your own children. Whereas in The Tenant of Wildfell Hall, Anne, through her protagonist Helen and through the other characters, talks about different viewpoints in how we raise children and the differences in the raising of children and ultimately what the outcome of the way you've raised your children is. And I love this viewpoint in The Tenant of Wildfell Hall because we get some really interesting conversations going on between the characters, one of which happens very early in the book, where Helen is talking about raising her young son Arthur who is a fantastic character one of my favorites in the book but she's talking about him around alcohol and how he doesn't even like the smell of alcohol which is a sense of foreshadowing because later on we realize why he doesn't like it but during this conversation Mrs Markham the main character Gilbert's mother says to Helen well, but you will treat him like a girl. You'll spoil his spirit and make a mere Miss Nancy of him and talks about how she'll get Mr. Millwood, the vicar, to talk to you about it. He'll tell you the consequences. Now, Helen isn't having any of this. They have very different views on raising children. And Helen responds to her and Gilbert saying, granted, but would you use the same argument with regard to a girl? Which is something that comes up frequently in the novel. There are many conversations between characters and through these conversations you get to see their different relationships with each other. I think other than a social commentary Anne is also using this as a device to comment on Helen's differences with the other characters and her attitude towards life in comparison to them. You also see this comparison in the differences between Helen and the character of Eliza Millwood who are almost set up as rivals in love although as you get further through the novel you see Gilbert shed his love for Eliza, seeing it as something that was superficial and seeing his love and respect for Helen grow. At the centre of this supposed love triangle though is not Gilbert as you would expect but instead Gilbert being swayed by his mother Mrs Markham and if you've read a book like Pride and Prejudice and know the character of Mrs Bennet then I think there are many comparisons between the two and yet you see Mrs Markham at a different angle because she is worried about her son rather than her daughters. At one point in the book Mrs Markham says to Gilbert that it is his business to please himself but his wife's business to please him which I think really sums up attitudes of the day but when we see this in in relation to Mrs Bennet, Mrs Bennet has to think about her daughters and marrying off her daughters. Women in the society and before are ticking time bombs, they have to get married and their success relies on them getting married, whereas success for a man is finding the right wife who will please him. And the mark of a good woman is how good she is as a wife. She is always seen in relation to her husband. Where it gets complicated though is that these aren't just views that are commonly held. These views are also reflected in the laws of the day, which is why marriage for Helen is such an issue because when she marries Arthur Huntingdon, her property and her possessions cease being her own and now whatever she owns belongs to her husband. Women are raised to be 
good wives. And we see this again at the start of the novel with Rose Markham, Gilbert's sister, when Gilbert has come in late to tea and their mother is ordering Rose to put on some tea for him. And Rose has this amazing outburst where she says, well, if it had been me now, I should have had no tea at all. If it had been Fergus, their other brother, even, he would have had to put up with such as there was and been told to be thankful for it was far too good for him. But you, we can't do too much for you. It's always so. If there's anything particularly nice at table, Mama winks and nods at me to abstain from it. And if I don't attend to that, she whispers, don't eat so much of that, Rose. Gilbert will like it for his supper. She also talks about the various roles she has to do and how she puts herself out and has to put herself out for the other male characters in the book, saying that if she's in the parlour, her mother says, come Rose, put away your things and let's have the room nice and tidy against they come in and keep up a good fire. Gilbert likes a cheerful fire. In the kitchen, make that pie a large one, Rose. I dare say the boys will be hungry and don't put so much pepper in. They'll not like it, I'm sure. If I say, well, Mama, I don't, I'm told I ought not to think of myself. You know, Rose, in all household matters, we have only two things to consider. First, what's proper to be done. And secondly, what's most agreeable to the gentlemen of the house. Anything will do for the ladies. Even though Rose isn't a central character, I love this glimpse into her life and how it just seems so cruel on her. And yet that was the commonly held view of the day. Going back to the point about raising children though, and I'm really interested to know how, how we are raised is not just affected by how we are as children, but also how we are as adults and how people around us shape who we are, which is what I think we see in the character of Arthur Huntingdon, who is an addict and a gambler and is unable to stay faithful to Helen. And I think that the way he acts in the book is because there is nobody around him telling him that this is wrong. He surrounds himself by people who behave the same way as he does. And so it's perfectly okay for him to act out. And I think the way he is in the book is partly the responsibility of the people around him. So of course you have to take responsibility for your own actions but when you're surrounded by a group of people who act exactly the same as you do, it becomes okay to act exactly as you are and you don't need to question why you are acting in a certain way. This is where the concept of universal salvation comes in because throughout the novel, Arthur Huntingdon has a complete disregard for the consequences of his actions, whether those are the consequences on earth or the consequences in heaven. Not forgetting that so much of Anne's writing relies on her religious belief and other people's religious beliefs, weaving them into the text so that they feel as much a part of the book as anything else. So is there hope after death for Arthur Huntingdon? I'm not so much interested in what he says, but what Helen says during the last scenes of the novel when he is dying. And Helen says, but thank God I have hope that through whatever purging fires the erring spirit may be doomed to past, whatever fate awaits it, still it is not not lost, and God who hateth nothing that he hath made will bless it in the end. So the idea behind universal salvation is that no matter what you have done on earth, God will forgive you. He is a benevolent and forgiving God, and so you will still end up in heaven. At the time Anne was writing, this was a pretty controversial view that not many people would acknowledge or believe in. And Anne talks in a letter to the Reverend David Tom after the book's publication about how this is a view that she has cherished since she was young, but it's not something that she had seen in religious doctrine, but instead had always personally believed. And so it was something natural that she would include in the book. So I like to believe that although we should be held accountable for the way that we act in life, that there is a chance for forgiveness after death and whether you're religious or not, I think that Anne is talking about something that can be very universal. It's not just relating to death, it's also relating to how we are in life. And I think that I do find something very spiritual in reading Anne's writing. I want to believe what she believes. I want to believe that people are inherently good and we shouldn't necessarily blame them because there are reasons for them being that way. And from a contextual point of view, there was a lot going on in Anne 
Anne's life that would make her question whether people could be forgiven after their deaths. For example, at the time that The Tenant of Wildfell Hall was published, Branwell had spiralled into a very bad place with his addiction, and just a few months after the book was published, he would die. And I'd like to think that Anne was pondering these questions about Arthur, but also about her own brother. Despite his addiction, would he end up in heaven. And I think that Branwell can often be considered the villain of the Bronte story, but I still think that there were reasons for his addiction too. He saw so many deaths in his early life, there was so much temptation and so much pressure on him to achieve good things that really there is no wonder that he ended up like he was. And that isn't to excuse his behaviour, but I also think that Anne was also searching for a reason why he was that way and what would end up to him once he died. So I think that's a very good note to end the final Bronte book club video. I think that we've read so many of the Bronte's books this year that have very many different themes in them that explore different ideas. We have the gothic nature of Wuthering Heights and Jane Eyre. We have the more realistic feel of Agnes Grey and the pure romanticism really of Sher as well as the magic feeling of Emily's poetry. But I'd like to think that no matter how you feel about each of the novels, what they give to me is hope for the future and for the past and hope for individual people. I'm so sad to be ending the Bronte Book Club here. I feel very emotional because I've had such a fantastic year as Young Ambassador. And even though I'll be continuing up until the end of this year, I still feel like the journey that I went on last year was just one of the best experiences of my life. I feel like such a more confident person now. I feel so much happier in my skin. I've loved exploring the books again and finding out what I love about them so much. And it's been a joy to see you enjoy them too, just as much as I do. And I've loved hearing about your ideas on the books and how they defer to mine, but also how we all share a love for reading and the Brontes. And getting to explore that alongside all of you has been incredible. So before this video ends, I'd like to thank everybody at the Bronte Parsonage Museum and the Bronte Society for letting me run this book club throughout 2018 and for being just the most incredible people. If you get a chance to visit the museum you definitely should. The display in 2018 is all about Patrick and in 2020 they're also going to be celebrating the life of Anne Bronte. So I've just loved all of the bicentenary events, it's been such an honour and I really hope you enjoyed the book club. So thank you so much for watching my Bronte book club videos. I'll leave a link in the description to all the videos in the full playlist so you can watch them back if you'd like to and I will see you guys soon. Happy reading!